All right. I hope everyone can hear me. Maybe some of the audience who's joining remotely can give me a thumbs up whether they hear me. Yes, Alexander, I saw you. Thank you. Um, okay, welcome. This is our second hybrid meeting and there's still technical uh, challenges uh, on the way. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm very much honored to uh, welcome today Tumo. You correct me if, I'm, if I pronounce the name wrong. <laughs> Tumo Mäki Mattunen. Yeah, good enough. Thanks. <laughs> um, giving us a presentation today uh, titled Biochemically Detailed Modeling of Cortical Synaptic Plasticity Application to Schizophrenia Research. And um, before he starts, I will just briefly introduce him. And uh, I just want to say that this record, this, um, this presentation will be recorded um and will be later published to our um our youtube channel so uh tumo is um is finnish he has been doing his uh, phd thesis with maya lena lina at tampa university and i met him while he was postdoc with gauta einewall at the university of oslo and uh, later he was postdoc at similar research laboratory also in oslo and I remember his uh, calm Finnish temper, always very helpful. And uh, therefore, I'm very much honored that now, uh, as an academia research fellow at Temple University, he's uh, joining us today and visiting us in Frankfurt here with his uh, small family or young family. Not so <laughs> and um, so, Tumo, the floor is yours. And um, if you are interested in if you're interested in uh, this work in more detail, um, there is, is at least one publication which is uh, should be directly related to this presentation. Mm -hmm. So looking forward to you speaking to more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to come here to talk about our work. Um, I will share the screen. Oh, let me just end my sharing. Yeah, so um, I will give you a talk about this uh, eLife paper that uh, that uh, came last year, um, and uh, I will also discuss a little bit about how it's related to schizophrenia research because that's kind of where where the motivation for this work came from. Yeah, so um, uh, I will start with um, with a kind of motivation. Uh, what is uh, how might uh, plasticity be impaired in schizophrenia? and uh, how that uh, gives a need for a biochemically detailed model of uh, cortical synaptic plasticity and uh, then about our goal a specific goal to reproduce uh, the spike timing dependent plasticity results of this paper uh, 14 years ago and then uh, how we use the existing uh, models and what we did to adjust them and then uh, a little bit about the, how we attained this goal uh, the results and conventional type of uh, long-term long-term potentiation and depression, and then uh, if there's time, uh, a little bit about the robustness of the model and uh, the parameter space, and finally how we fit it to different uh, sets of experimental data, and then in the end a little bit about how to how we are uh, both uh, in the future and uh, now ongoing work, uh, trying to use this model to to study uh, cortical plasticity um, impairments in schizophrenia. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm happy that, uh, that uh, there are people here also in, in person. It's been a while actually giving a pre presentation to, <laughs> to live people. <laughs> but uh, if uh, there's any, at any moment, uh, question, uh, feel free to interrupt. And also, I hope I will hear if you open your mic from the, from the um, uh, online. Uh, you can also, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can also try to raise your hand, but uh, I don't promise to see it. So uh, there are many people to acknowledge in this uh, line of research where we model uh, schizophrenia related phenotypes. Um, but uh, this work is uh, mostly contributed by uh, Avram Blackwell and Gautte Einewall, and uh, also by uh, Andy Edwards and Nicolangelo Iannella. So um, why study uh, plasticity in schizophrenia? and um, uh, and especially computational modeling of plasticity. So uh, cognitive symptoms of uh, schizophrenia, such as uh, learning de deficits and, um, and uh, impairment, impaired uh, working memory, 
uh, they uh, they have been hypothesized to be caused by uh, synaptic plasticity or alterations of synaptic plasticity. And um, um, there are also uh, schizophrenia phenotypes. I don't know if you are all familiar with the word phenotype, but it means kind of a characteristic trait of a certain either organism or a disease. So uh, symptoms could be uh, could be also phenotypes, but usually when we talk about phenotypes of uh, schizophrenia, we mean some uh, some traits, for example, that can be measured by EEG um, and that are characteristic of the disease and uh, not so much of uh, uh, healthy controls. And uh, here are three uh, phenotypes uh, mentioned. Uh, one is the long-term potentiation like plasticity of uh, visual evoked potentials. Uh, so um, when you give a checkerboard visual stimulus to, um, to uh, schizophrenia patients, um, for each, um, each reversal of the checkerboard, you get, a, get an ERB near to the visual cortex. But um, in, in healthy controls, it usually gets potentiated over time if you keep repeating this checkerboard uh, reversal. But in schizophrenia patients, it's uh, diminished, this potentiation. And uh, that's uh, uh, suggested to be an uh, impairment of uh, cortical plasticity. And likewise, there are motor cortical plasticity impairments uh, in schizophrenia uh, patients. And also mismatch negativity. It's a very wi widely, widely studied phenotype. It's where you give a kind of an oddball paradigm, uh, auditory oddball, that there's a, there are standard beeps, uh, identical beeps, uh, um, and then uh, every now and then a uh, deviant, uh, deviant beep, uh, either by pitch or duration. And then for the, those, um, um, both in healthy controls and schizophrenia patients, the, the deviant has a different EEG response, but uh, how much it's uh, different is uh, diminished in schizophrenia. And uh, that's also uh, NMD, NMDA receptor dependent uh, phenomenon, although it's uh, arguable whether it's uh, long term or short term uh, plasticity. And uh, then finally, there are genome wide association studies that point towards uh, uh, impaired uh, or at least altered uh, uh, plasticity. I will show some more in the next slide. Uh, so uh, here's a figure from a paper from four, four years ago. Um, here you can imagine the membrane of a cell or synapse, and there are many different uh, neuro, um, neurotransmitter pathways here, serotonergic, dopaminergic, glutamatergic, and cholinergic. And uh, all these blue and uh, cyan and uh, red, yellow, green uh, genes are schizophrenia associated genes, so uh, they have been obtained from this um, genome-wide association studies of uh, hundreds of thousands or at least tens of thousands of uh, patients and controls. And they have found that, that there are variants in these uh, genes that are more likely to be found in schizophrenia uh, subjects than healthy controls. And uh, there's a lot of uh, voltage gating ion, ion channels and, um, and uh, synaptic receptors, but then there's a lot of uh, also intracellular signaling proteins that somehow regulate plasticity. Uh, for example, PKA and uh, PKC is not here, but that's also also altered. So there, uh, there's a kind of a, kind of a two ways in which uh, plasticity, at least two ways in which plasticity could be um, impaired, either because of the what's happening in the in the voltage-gated ion channels or synaptic receptors, or what's going on here in the intracellular signaling cascades, and uh, that's what we want to model. Uh, have a cortical model of cortical plasticity that could kind of uh, uh, catch both of these. So that's pretty much the motivation for our model of build, uh, or for mo building this model. Um, so uh, uh, we, uh, we started this work around 2017 and um, Avram had just uh, published this paper um, um, in plus computational biology. Uh, where they have a, a biochemically detailed model of um, of uh, CA uh, uh, hippocampal plasticity, CA1, if I remember right. And uh, this one, this model describes the um, PKA pathway and uh, also the CAM kinesis 2 pathway. So uh, for those of you who are not that familiar with this kind of models, um, what you what you do is you model the 
number of uh, proteins in different states and uh, or concentrations could be uh, and then the reactions between the different species and then uh, when time progresses uh, the the concentrations change uh, in response to different stimuli and uh, Avrama used this uh, stochastic diffusion simulator NeuroRD um, which um, uh, so instead of uh, deterministically uh, determining that uh, how much uh, are the concentrations changed it simulates the the stochastically simulates the reactions that will take place and then then um, Mm, yeah, gives the output uh, as a kind of a, it's a proper probabilistic uh, simulator. We used that one, but we also used the uh, neuron RxD, which is de deterministic uh, uh, modeling of the same system. So uh, just uh, how you model this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, or how you simulate this kind of models, uh, you uh, describe each reaction, the reactants and the products, and then the forward and uh, reverse rates and uh, then you are pretty much ready to go. All you need in addition is the initial value of each of these uh, proteins and, and um, molecules, and then uh, possibly the inputs that are given to the um, system. For example, calcium is entering here uh, to the, to the um, cell through NMDA receptors. Uh, so uh, our plan was to extend this model uh, so that it could reproduce uh, experimental data on cortical LTP, LTD. And uh, the, the experimental data that we in particular wanted to reproduce was this uh, Seol et al. from 2007. And uh, in this paper, they show that, uh, that um, spike timing dependent plasticity in visual cortex uh, was uh, gated by neuromodulators. Uh, namely beta adrenergic um, uh, norepinephrine and uh, acetylcholine and uh, they did uh, experiments uh, where they uh, stimulated uh, visual cortex at layer four and then recorded at um, layer two three or both uh, stimulated and recorded at layer two three um, i don't know if you are all familiar with spike timing dependent plasticity um, so um, yeah, uh, when uh, when they didn't uh, have any neuromodulation, uh, um, namely no norepinephrine and no um, uh, acetylcholine, they didn't find any STDP, neither LTP, neither uh, sorry LTD, and uh, that's uh, quite kind of surprising uh, for because sometimes you in some uh, brain areas you find it uh, even without any neuromodulation. But uh, then when they activated the uh, adenylyl cyclase pathway uh, by, um, by um, introducing uh, beta adrenergic uh, receptor agents, then they found LTP in both post-pre and pre-post uh, uh, protocols. And so uh, that, that is neither typical in this STDP because usually you have LTD for post-pre and LTP for pre-post protocols. But when they activated the PLC pathway uh, through uh, cholinergic receptors, then they found LTD for both uh, post-pre and pre-post protocols. And finally, when they activated both pathways, uh, they found uh, this uh, classical STDP. So uh, LTP in pre-post protocols and LTD in post-pre protocol. And then, um, based on uh, based on uh, previous research and uh, also this paper, we kind of hypothesized that uh, what might be going on here. Can you see the pointer? Yeah. So, uh, in when there is no neuromodulation, uh, uh, we, we assume that there is the same exactly the same amount of uh, calcium coming in, and it uh, activates the calmodulin and calmkinesis two pathways, mm -hmm. but that is uh, not enough to phosphorylate the gluar one in this, um, um, in this uh, serine 831, uh, which, uh, which is the CAMK2 um, target, or maybe it uh, phosphorylates it, but it's not enough to induce plasticity. But when, they, when there's uh, both um, uh, norepinephrinic uh, um, neuromodulation and the same calcium inputs, uh, then just a second. I think my pointer is not working very well. I think I should move oh, I this window. You yeah, see it? Yeah, we see it. Okay. I think when I move it here in the corner, I cannot see it. Oh, true. 
let me just uh, just a second change it yeah yeah so when we have uh, both uh, norepinephrine and the calcium inputs uh, then there is uh, both pka uh, activated and cam kinesis 2 activated and uh, they uh, phosphorylate uh, different serine sites in this uh, gluar 1 receptor which is the subunit of AMPA receptors and uh, pka uh, uh, the phosphorylation of the pka site makes uh, the gluar receptors more likely to be inserted to the membrane uh, while this CAMK2 site uh, makes it uh, have a higher single channel conductance. And then if a uh, PLC pathway is activated, but uh, not this PKA pathway, then um, uh, PLC through either M1 receptors or glutamatergic uh, uh, metapotropic glutamate receptors uh, activates PKC and PKC phosphorylates gluar 2 subunits. So it's another uh, subunit of the AMPA receptor. But uh, by con in contrast to GLUR1, when this one is phosphorylated, it's, it's more likely to be uh, removed from the membrane. So uh, we have to that that's uh, what's uh, going on uh, in this LTD. And then finally, when you have both, uh, you get both LTP and LTD. Uh, the thing uh, here is that uh, the PLC pathway, according to our model, is uh, more sensitive to calcium. So you need less calcium to have this pathway activated. And that's why you get uh, first LTD. And then uh, when you increase the, the um, input uh, amplitude, then you get LTP. Um, any questions uh, so far? I have a very small question. Yeah. Um, like you mentioned about the paper like so that how the results were trying to replicate on mm. the first step. And the recording from layer one and three, do you happen to know like what kind of recording was it? Like was it an LFT mm. recording or what did it produce? Maybe we can repeat the question that everyone yeah, can yeah. So so the question was that uh, what kind of uh, experiment was it? Was it uh, intracellular or uh, or field potential recordings here? And I have to say, I don't remember, but usually, especially when it's STDP, you usually patch both uh, posts and, and pre. Um, so I would guess it's uh, that they actually patched uh, both, but I would have to check. Yeah, so um, um, I think, uh, what's the time? Maybe I should keep an eye on the, yeah. I'll go quickly through what we did to change the model. So um, uh, in Avramas model, we uh, there was this uh, S, uh, serine 845 and serine 831 uh, 831 phosphorylation of GLUR1, but they didn't have the insertion of GLUR1 to the membrane. So we uh, added that one from Haier and Bala uh, 2005. And then we added a PKC pathway uh, from uh, Avramas uh, or earlier papers from Avramas lab and uh, also the PKC dependent GLUR2 endocytosis from uh, uh, Gallimore's paper 2018 um, and then we changed uh, or switched to the Calmodulin model uh, I think we took it also from this Gallimore et al paper and uh, we added uh, persistently active PKC to allow a long term or uh, longer term uh, depression and uh, fit it the forward rate of that reaction and then we also uh, adjusted the pka at pka activation scheme a little bit i won't go into details to that one um but uh, we uh, this uh, dashed line was uh, the one we cut with the, uh, with the pr previous model and then with the newer model we got a longer lasting um, serine 845 phosphorylation uh, the maybe the biggest uh, kind of uh, novelty of our or, uh, methodological methodological novelty of our paper was that we introduced this um, this uh, statistical rule because I earlier in the slide mentioned that we had both this uh, GLUR1 and GLUR2 receptor subunits and uh, it's not obvious uh, that if you have both uh, pathways um, uh, affecting the uh, membrane insertion of both uh, subunits. Uh, how does it uh, affect uh, the final um, uh, synaptic conductance? So uh, if you really wanted to do this uh, uh, thoroughly, you would uh, actually model uh, the, um, the um, composition of these uh, amper receptors. 
because they are tetramers, they have each four subunits. They can be either homomeric uh, gluar one, ola gluar one, or ola gluar two, or some kind of heteromeric uh, gluar, even gluar three can be there. So uh, what we did uh, that uh, instead of uh, modeling the the tetramere formation because that's uh, very difficult to do because you would in principle have to have like uh, thousands of different states where where uh, there's a concentration of if each different kind of uh, tetramere. So in, in practice, it's not feasible. What we did was that we modeled the membrane insertion of the uh, subunits into the membrane, and then um, assuming that. Uh, that uh, these um, subunits on the membrane uh, uh, randomly connect to each other to form uh, different kinds of tetramers. We uh, found or like um, calculated that how many of each different kind of tetramer you will uh, probably have on the membrane. So it's kind of uh, going from um, uh, the opposite direction that that one biologically should do, but uh, that's the best we could do. So what this model gives us is that uh, there's the at each uh, time moment we can get the, the prediction that there is a certain number of uh, gluar one subunits on the membrane, and um, uh, certain amount of these is uh, phosphorylated at this CAMK2 site, and then there's also a certain number of uh, gluar two subunits on the membrane, and then we just calculate the probability that uh, what is the probability that uh, random uh, Tetramer will be uh, blue R1 homomeric, and uh, none of the subunits will be phosphorylated in this CAMK site. And uh, we get a kind of a, a approximation of, uh, for this probability. And we do the same for all different kinds of uh, tetramers. We are only interested in, uh, in heteromers, meaning uh, blue R1, blue R2 heteromer, and uh, blue R2 homomers. And then these two kind of types of uh, gluar one tetramers, either a homomeric where one or more of them is phosphorylated, uh, or homomer where they are all non-phosphorylated. I'll come back to that later. Why? Why this? So uh, then um, uh, we can also uh, estimate the expected number of each of these types of uh, tetramers, uh, and this this will be all based on the model predictions. And it can be it can be calculated uh, offline. We don't need uh, these uh, uh, variables uh, in the model themselves. And then um, there's this paper from 2005 that uh, has a they estimated experimentally the uh, the, the single channel conductances of these uh, four types of uh, of uh, tetramers. And uh, then we use those data in our model. And uh, then we can kind of get a total uh, synaptic conductance um, based on our uh, model uh, model predictions. Yeah. Um, so then uh, to the results, uh, unless there's anything to ask from about the methods methodology, um, we can also discuss more in the end. So um, uh, so then we uh, used this same uh, um, uh, stimulation protocol that was in this cell at all paper. Um, and uh, to, to do this, we simulated the uh, layer two, three pyramidal cell, but this time using just uh, biophysically detailed uh, multi-compartment model. So in this model, there's nothing going on uh, on a subcellular level. Uh, or at least uh, none of these uh, intracellular cascades that I mentioned are modeled. And uh, then we inserted the spine in uh, this black, black region uh, around 250 to 300 uh, micrometers from the soma. And uh, that will be the, the synapse uh, from the layer four. So, um, um, so uh, this, uh, uh, this um, alpha, uh, shaped um, or double dual exponential shape here is the presynaptic uh, stimulus and then uh, here uh, this one um, is the postsynaptic stimulation so in this case four pulses uh, with uh, maybe 10 millisecond uh, uh, interval and depending on the on the post pre interval you will have a different um, different uh, membrane potential at the spine that we inserted 
So in this case, uh, it's a post pre. So it's first uh, the post synaptic uh, cell. The soma is stimulated by four pulses, and then uh, 50 milliseconds later, uh, the presynaptic uh, spine is uh, stimulated. And uh, this shows the uh, membrane potential at the spine. And then this red one is the magnesium gating variable. And uh, for zero and 50 milliseconds, you, you get much uh, larger magnesium gating uh, variable. Uh, sorry, actually, it's a, a kind of an an anti gating. So the higher the magnesium gating variable here, the more it will be open. And from that, we can then uh, calculate the calcium transients uh, to the spine. And, um, and um, in this case, I'm showing the calcium concentration uh, at the spine. So in this uh, 50 and 10 millisecond case, I have larger uh, calcium uh, concentrations than in this uh, minus 50 milliseconds. And then uh, we can plug that uh, calcium transients to our, uh, our um, uh, biochemically detailed model. So then again, we are only uh, simulating the single spine, but uh, with uh, the full, uh, full biochemical reactions. So here uh, I'm uh, measuring the relative number of gluar one receptors at the membrane. So divided by the basal uh, amount of gluar one at, um, at the membrane. And when I uh, change this uh, interstimulus interval from minus 50 to 150 milliseconds, um, uh, we can see that uh, uh, in in the presence of uh, beta adrenergic ligands, uh, it's uh, there's a lot of uh, exocytosis. Uh, insertion of gluar one to the membrane, but uh, in the absence of this uh, beta adrenergic lig ligands, there's less because uh, PKA is not activated that much, and uh, therefore gluar one will not be inserted into membrane so much. And gluar two, not much happens because in this case we are not giving the acetylcholine um, at all. And when I have this gluar one and gluar two at the membrane, then I, I can use this statistical rule to calculate the total synaptic strength according to our model. And then we get this uh, relatively strong LTP um, uh, throughout, um, well, actually not so much in the in post pre, but anyway, there's no, no depression at all here. Um, yeah, and it's, uh, for that, uh, it's needed this uh, norepinephrine. And then when I have uh, acetylcholine, uh, there's not uh, nothing different happening in gluar one, but uh, gluar two is uh, is um, um, taken away from the membrane, and um, the higher the calcium transients, then the more it is taken uh, removed from the membrane. And then uh, in the absence of um, of uh, beta adrenergic stimulation, uh, we get uh, only LTD. And in the presence of both, uh, both acetylcholine and norepinephrine, we get uh, this uh, um, LTD for post-pre uh, stimuli, stimuli and LTP for uh, pre-post uh, protocols. So uh, it qualitatively uh, uh, reproduces this, uh, this data from this Seoletal paper. Yeah. Um, then uh, we also studied that uh, because this uh, shape was a bit uh, unusual that it stayed so uh, long here uh, in the LTD region, and we found out that it's it may be due to this uh, SK channels uh, because when you only give a, a single burst, which uh, here we see that it doesn't uh, activate SK currents so much, then it returns quicker to the baseline. Than, than in the presence of uh, SK, channel, SK activation. And um, here's a bit more about uh, these pathways, but um, maybe I, I will, most of this, I'll just mention that uh, uh, when we give uh, conventional high frequency stimulation to the spine, uh, we get LTP. And uh, when we give LFS, we get, get uh, LTD. And for this, we needed both uh, both uh, these neuromodulatory pathways. Uh, we maybe got it um, uh, even without it. Um, uh, there will be some potentiation, but it may be not so long lasting. And I think for LTP, we needed it uh, altogether. 
Uh, yeah, so here the upper row is for LTP, uh, HFS uh, mediated LTP, and the lower one for um, uh, low frequency stimulation uh, mediated LTD. Yeah, um, we did also did some uh, robustness analysis of the model. So it's relatively robust, although there are certain parameter changes that it's very, very uh, sensitive to. So here we changed all, um, I think it was around 100 different um, uh, rate coefficients or rate uh, parameters that we changed by plus minus 10 percent. And the ones that uh, were um, uh, had a effect larger than 15 percent to the amplitude of the uh, LTP or LTD are named here. But I won't go too much into the de details. We also did a Monte Carlo analysis of the parameter space, uh, and uh, we showed that uh, that uh, you can get very very many different types of uh, plasticity curves. So um, the one that uh, we neuro neuroscientists are maybe most uh, familiar with are this uh, BCM type uh, plasticity curves that um, which also underlies this uh, prediction of STDB that we have that uh, when you give um, uh, small calcium inputs, you get LTD, such as happens here in this uh, green curve here. But when you give uh, more, then you get LTP. Uh, but there are also in some uh, some um, uh, parameter combinations, you only get LTD, and in some parameter combinations, you only get LTP. So it's uh, dependent on the parameters as as expected. Here we did some analysis of the parameter space, uh, but I think I'll I'll skip that one. Uh, let me see the time. Yeah. Uh, well, the, these are the final sets of results I, I want to show for finishing. So um, one thing we also wanted to attain with this model was a kind of a, a unified picture of, um, or at least a um, means to get a unified picture of uh, what's going on in uh, synaptic plasticity in general in the cortex, because there are so many different uh, different experimental results uh, showing so many different uh, uh, plasticity outcomes for for a given uh, stimulation protocols, and we we went through uh, some of them. Here are eight different publications and uh, eleven um, uh, data sets from these publications where they did uh, certain plasticity experiments in a given uh, uh, cortical area. Here's entorhinal cortex, prefrontal cortex, uh, parallel cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, uh, visual cortex, auditory cortex. And uh, the pathways are also sometimes different. Um, and uh, our kind of uh, um, hope was that we could uh, fit uh, our model to, to all of these uh, these data sets and then make predictions of uh, what's what's really going on in this uh, brain areas. So, uh, how how is the uh, how is the um, for example the um, let's say the protein expressions uh, different in uh, in certain brain cortical area compared to another one, um, given that uh, the plasticity outcome is different in the two. Um, so um, yeah, we just uh, plugged all these. Uh, uh, stimulation protocols to our model. And as you can see, some of them only have a single experiment. For example, this Kotak et al. They only did, um, they didn't do any controls of uh, blocking certain um, uh, receptors or or introducing some uh, neuro neuromodulators or blocking neuromodulators. But in some, uh, for example, visual cortex, uh, let me see. Yeah. They did uh, both uh, control with high frequency stimulation, control with low frequency stimulation, and then uh, CAMK2 inhibited high, uh, with the both cases, high frequency and low frequency stimulation. And uh, then uh, what we did, uh, did in our model, we did uh, or simulated the exact same uh, um, um, manipulation and the same uh, um, uh, stimulation protocol. and. Uh, and um, uh, checked if we can get uh, we, we can reproduce this uh, data set all these four different uh, uh, different um, um, they are, uh, manipulations and uh, we did it uh, uh, separately to all these 11 data sets 
and uh, yeah, we uh, we were we were focused on uh, the plasticity at ten minutes, fifteen minutes, and twenty minutes, and uh, to to determine that whether we get a acceptable parameter set or not, we we wanted uh, the final outcome of our model to be within one stand on average on one standard deviation from the from the data. Yeah. Um, so uh, in most cases we could uh, do that. Uh, uh, sadly, for this uh, most complete data set, we were not able to do it. We were able to do it uh, for two at the, two of these um, uh, manipulations at the time, but not all four. And now with the ongoing work, uh, we also managed to do this uh, for all all four at the same time. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, uh, we we were able to reproduce this data. And then um, here we can, for example, uh, if I go back a little bit, uh, this is the, uh, I believe it's the EC1 um, data set that had three different manipulations. And then the Kota et al that had only one manipulation. And you can see that uh, in this Kota et al, uh, these are the parameter sets that uh, reproduce this, uh, this uh, data. And they are very variable, uh, almost all of these parameters, while in this, uh, in this uh, EC1 data set uh, from internal cortex, uh, some of the parameters are very nicely um, um, restricted. How much time do I have? Yeah, so yeah. Mm. Uh, we also made some uh, model predictions. Um, uh, we we uh, estimated uh, the plasticity outcome using uh, the same uh, stimulation protocol for all these uh, different uh, data sets. And for, uh, for most of them, they gave quite variable results. And also when we blocked uh, certain, um, certain um, proteins, CAMK2, PKA or PKC, we got uh, uh, some of them gave quite variable results. W what we kind of got out of this uh, would be that uh, it would be advisable in these experimental papers to do report as many uh, as possible of these uh, stimulation protocols and uh, manipulations, and uh, then it would be possible to tune this model uh, to even uh, to get uh, kind of more more accurate model predictions. But uh, yeah, sadly, it's probably only us modelers who are really interested in <laughs> in this kind of um, uh, this kind of data. So. We'll have to wait for that kind of data to be really available. Yeah, um, then I promised to discuss a little bit uh, the, how to use this for schizophrenia. So um, as I mentioned, uh, it could be that uh, either this uh, intercellular, uh, intercellular signaling regulating genes or the uh, ion channel encoding genes are somehow altered in schizophrenia or both. And uh, uh, what we did earlier in our um, in our um, uh, network modeling. Uh, so here in this Maggie et al. 2019 paper, we modeled a network of uh, 150 uh, layer five pyramidal cells and uh, checked out that what happens uh, when we alter the expression or the dynamics of these uh, schizophrenia associated genes, and uh, we found that uh, they. Uh, if you if you implement uh, small uh, small variants of this uh, expression or dynamics, you get small effects. But when you combine them, which is what what we expect to happen in a polygenic disease like schizophrenia, then you get larger larger effects. And uh, this is a purely kind of a short time scale phenomenon, uh, so no nothing related to plasticity here. But then we could do the same uh, for the plastic plasticity here. Uh, so here I'm uh, doing this STDP experiments again, but uh, changing this uh, high voltage activated calcium channel conductance or low voltage activated or HEN channel or slow potassium channels or SK channels. Um, and, and they are all encoded by these, some of these uh, schizophrenia associated genes. And here I changed it plus minus 20% to the maximal conductance and uh, observed uh, either uh, impairments or or enhancements of uh, of uh, the uh, LTP LTD amplitudes, and uh, again uh, when you when you combine these uh, different effects, uh, you can get uh, larger effects, which is not 
not really a big big news, but uh, it's kind of gives a gives a tool to evaluate that how how large effects uh, can we expect to to uh, there to be in order that when you combine them to get some kind of observable effects. Tuomo, can I have a question? Yeah. So the SK channels uh, are the are these channels in the spine or um, elsewhere in the cell? Because I think previously you showed um, SK channel effect, but I I think I missed uh, whether I think that was in the spine. Um, I I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, experimentally it has been shown that they they are in the spine. Yes. Yeah. But in the models that we use, uh, we, we don't usually have spines, except the one uh, single one that we uh, insert in order to do this STDP. Um, ah, okay. And in, in that single spine, uh, you, you have those SK channels or you don't? No, uh, it's purely passive, the one that I... Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it, it would be good to uh, add there actually everything that's going on there, but it's difficult to get uh, data that what, what is actually there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, that's really all I have to show. So uh, as a conclude, so we developed this uh, single compartment model uh, that uh, describes the major uh, pathways uh, uh, for LDP, LDD in the cortex and hippocampus. And um, uh, we reproduce the conventional types of LDP, LDD, as well as STDP. And uh, it uh, explains uh, how different forms of plasticity uh, may depend on the concentrations of these different uh, proteins in the PKA, PTKC pathways, and CAMK2 pathway as well. And uh, it can uh, provide a means to explore the mechanisms of uh, mental disorders. So that's really everything I wanted to show. So I'd be happy to answer some questions if you have. Thanks for your attention. Have a look at the, maybe we keep your microphone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. There's no one uh, with a question. I would, I would go first. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so my question is actually from the slide where you were showing all the 11 data sets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, in the slide, so basically you talked about like, uh, like in, in these two days that I couldn't help but notice like in one data set they mention adults and in one data set they mention um, four to six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so my question is basically, so your model fits all of them equally well or are there some data sets where your model basically fits better? Uh, yeah, there are some that are fits better. And uh, as I showed uh, this uh, data sets uh, with this model, we were not able to, to reproduce at all, no. all four at the same time. So is it dependent mm. on the, like, the age of what, like the age of organism that we measured in or like, what factor does it depend on? Um, I think in this case, it's more a technical challenge that we were not able to, uh, to parameterize the, the model well enough to, to to, uh, to reproduce the data. It could be that uh, the model was uh, adding some components because then when we later updated the model uh, in a way that I didn't show here, then we were able to, to uh, reproduce this data. But uh, then we also did some other things too. So I should actually uh, analyze uh, quite in detail what we did differently uh, if, if, I, if I have time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also some, uh, some data sets were easier to to, um, uh, to reproduce because they had maybe a larger standard deviation and uh, or yeah there are many reasons uh, what could contribute in the one small question i was confused it's a kind of a stupid question though but like in the one where you were talking about the interspike interval mm. i was just wondering how like what does the negative interspike interval mean because it goes to my negative one yeah um it's a uh, measured uh from the last uh, postsynaptic stimulus uh, to the um, presynaptic stimulus, or actually is it the other way around? Yeah, from, uh, because here it's uh, positive 50. So it's the time interval from the onset of the presynaptic stimulus to the last uh, onset of the postsynaptic stimulus. So when it's negative, then it, they just come in different order. 
Mm -hmm. um, maybe one more question. Maybe I missed it, but how did you choose the major postsynaptic pathways? How did we choose? Yes, um, you wanted to model the major postsynaptic mm, yeah. pathways. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you choose that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we you should repeat the question. I don't know what. That yeah, is. yeah. So the question was that uh, how did we choose the uh, major that what pathways were major? Because I named uh, CAMK2, PKC, and PKA as the major pathways. Uh, there are certainly others, um, but I think these three, uh, based on my literature review, were the ones that popped okay. up most that's most of them. Yeah. There's a lot of things going on in the uh, ERC and MEC, uh, which we don't model at all. And I think they are also related to the nuclear signaling. So it's uh, also a more complicated process. And, and uh, yeah, that we don't take into account. Thank you. Yeah, Peter has a question. Yeah, Peter. Um, yeah, so I have a question. Um, so uh, did I get it right that um, if you try to simulate schizophrenia, then you you basically you you study the effects of voltage uh, uh, voltage dependent channel um, changes on plasticity, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what about? I think there there is a hypothesis in schizophrenia that directly that the plasticity can be impaired due to changes uh, in NMDA receptors. Mm -hmm. Am I am I right? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that, that would your model would show that too, right? Uh, but maybe that's uh, too trivial to show. Or um, yeah, it it would be uh, it's a it would be good to check that one too. Um, yeah, uh, purely looking at the genome-wide association point of view, you can see that the NMDA receptors are there, but they are only only one uh, one out of uh, I don't know one hundred. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, why why the NMDA receptor uh, uh, or the hypo hypo function of NMDA is uh, is uh, popular is that uh, there's a lot of uh, animal research data that kind of supports that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. All the other ones we don't yet have uh, um, animal supports or the data uh, supporting data from animal results. So yeah, it's uh, pro uh, you're right. It's it would be good to check that one too. Mm -hmm. But you can pro eas probably easily check uh, check that. that yeah, system. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cool that you can combine all these different uh, changes and study their their interplay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, one one other question I had was that in your plasticity model uh, there is no homeostatic mechanism, right? No, uh, no. metaplasticity. So mm -hmm. if you let it run for very long, then you would uh, probably not get stable weight. Um, if I run it very long, um, you mean the stimulation uh, would last very long or? Yeah, yeah, like minutes, Th then without a homeostatic mechanism, it's probably, yeah, it would not be expected from a model to give you stability. Mm, I mean, you wouldn't find in our model the same probably that happens in uh, reality because we don't have the compensatory mechanisms of that happen in homeostatic. Yeah, I think in, in our model, actually Christian is there also online. Uh, we also, in that uh, uh, voltage dependent model, we also didn't have a metaplasticity or mm. any homeostatic. Mm. So it, this could be an extension maybe of uh, your model and also our yeah. model. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of things going on um, on uh, that happens as a in response to prolonged uh, stimulation. So it could be that uh, these uh, uh, concentrations of these intracellular proteins uh, change in response to prolonged uh, stimulation. But yeah, that might be tricky to model in yeah. such a complicated biochemical model. Mm, mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's uh, one, one uh, challenge. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, can I have one last short question or, but I don't sure. want to take time from others. Uh, okay, so very quick, just for my understanding, uh, I think I don't know enough about neuromodulation, uh, but um, so in your model, uh, noradrenergic stimulation favors LTP and cholinergic stimulation favors LTD for uh, both pre, yeah. post and post pre. And so I thought that cholin cholinergic activation uh, is rather pro uh, uh, plasticity, uh, so is that yeah i was just asking how how yeah um so um as you see cholinergic uh, 
comes uh, through in our model yeah. M1 receptor and it activates uh, GQ and that leads to PLC and DHE uh, diacetylglyceride mm -hmm. or something and that activates PKC. I think that's that one is quite recognized that this is what happens. Mm -hmm. But then uh, it can uh, happen what we have in our model that it's uh, that the main target is this gluar 2 and uh, that is that is getting internalized. And uh, imagine if you have a gluar 2 dominated synapse, then the effect of this uh, would be purely uh, depressive depression. Mm -hmm. But uh, what actually happens uh, according to our model is that if you have a certain um, certain uh, distribution of uh, gluar 1 versus gluar 2 uh, subunits, then it can happen that uh, when you take out this from the membrane, then you will have a larger gluar 1 versus gluar 2 ratio. And then you will uh, have less of the hetero heterotetramers and more of the uh, homomeric gluar ones. And then, then according to our model, that produces again uh, uh, LTP, although it's it's exactly the same uh, uh, pathway mm -hmm. as in the LTP. Yeah, I see. So, but so when the animal learns, then you would expect both pathways to be active, like both cholinergic and adrenergic, or that's that's a difficult question. Uh, mm -hmm. I, ah, okay, maybe I'm jumping too far from a mo biochemical model to behavior. Uh, yeah, I, I would guess it's uh, dependent on the brain area, uh, whether you need both. Uh, it could be that the uh, learning is maximal when you have both, but it could be also that one suppresses the other. Uh, mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to tell. Okay, thanks. So Tumo, you, um, you showed how you derive the calcium transients by this biophysical model, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm always <laughs> looking through the lens of how to understand hippocampal regions here too, where such a model would also exist. But there it's known that you have interactions between input coming from distal and proximal dendrites. Would to speak anything against having like multi stimulation for such a model to estimate the, the these transients? Um, I think it uh, it would be possible to use this model that way. Um, yeah, I think Peter had a paper uh, where you, where you studied the kind of uh, effect of uh, distance from the soma. Uh, yeah, yeah, Cr Christian. Yeah, yeah, Christian yeah. develops it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it uh, we could use the same model, uh, this model for for that purpose as well. Mm. Yeah. And also there's this feature of uh, the perineal nets around uh, the proximal dendrites, which are supposed to buffer calcium. Can that be somehow also included? Is it? Um, then you would just have to uh, to alter the calcium transient some mm. way, uh, which is not predicted by our model. But uh, yeah, uh, in in our model we we assume that you you kind of know how the the calcium transient uh, mm. will be. Okay. Cool. Mm. Thanks. Okay, are there any further questions? Then I don't see any, neither here in the physical audience nor online. Then uh, thank you very again, Tumo. And um, yeah, uh, also to everyone attending here and a uh, nice discussion following. So see you and goodbye. I'll close here then. Thank you. Bye.